Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my respected seniors and friends, uh, today we are going to have a very important very discussion today, uh, organized by Kaho and uh, Aishman Bharat, a webinar on hand hygiene, the role in preventing the spread of COVID-19 virus infection. Uh, as you all are aware of, COVID-19 pandemic has spread to the to all uh, over the world in all countries across the continents. And it is imperative that we take precautions, and one of them being uh, hand hygiene. Uh, now, this is organized by Kaho. Basically, it's a nonprofit organization aimed at improving the quality of healthcare through promotion of quality initiatives and trainings. And Ayushman Bharat, as you all know, is the flagship uh, scheme of government of India as per the National Health Policy 2017. So, uh, hand hygiene day. Uh, today is the 5th of May, and every year this is uh, observed as the Hand Hygiene Day. Uh, this year's uh, campaign theme being Save Lives and Clean Your Hands. Uh, it has become a global priority, uh, and the aim is to inspire people for hand hygiene. Uh, we speak uh, volumes about infection control, a lot many things, uh, the high-end things, but if you look at Hand hygiene is the basis of all these infection control measures, and uh, if at all not followed, the other other uh, healthcare prevention uh, that we adopt. Dr. is the head of Healthcare and the director of uh, from Bangalore. To Shashank for your presentation, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeet, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for your fine words. Uh, a big round of applause to Kaho for organizing this wonderful program today uh, on this auspicious day, which is May 5th, which is the WHO World Hand Hygiene Day and also to Aishman Bharat for being a part of this uh, program for us. A uh, big warm welcome to uh, all the <coughs> participants who have been uh, participating from across India. Welcome to today's webinar. And uh, as we start today's webinar, we are going to see that uh, we're going to see a little bit of back history of our hand hygiene, how it started, where it went, uh, what are the few things that we need to keep in mind when we talk about hand hygiene, what are the different aspects that we need to keep in mind what are the techniques, what are the types of hand hygiene that we have, and what are the concentration that we're going to talk about, what are the areas that we're going to focus on today. And secondly, we'll also a little bit look into what is the coronavirus outbreak that currently the pandemic that is going on across the world and in India, uh, how hand hygiene plays an important role, both at your home and at your hospital also. Both these aspects is what we're going to try to cover today in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes that we have time today. And uh, we would also encourage all of you to please uh, put in your questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A. Uh, Jeet would be taking your questions and then we will answer it at the end of the session. So with that, we would like to start off today's session. So I'm going to start off with the first slide over here, which talks about uh, which talks about uh, where uh, all of this started off. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen this photo of Florence Nightingale, uh, who is considered one of the pioneers in when it comes to infection prevention and control across the, across the world. And uh, she has been quite instrumental when it comes to talking about various things. And one of the first things that uh, she talked about is that, you know, the first very requirement of a hospital that we should do no harm to the sick. That means it basically said that, you know, you're not supposed to cause any more hospital acquired infections to the patients other than the infection from which or the suffering from which the patient comes to you. So keeping this in mind, hospital infection control is a very important key aspect for us. Next, uh, another important person that I would like to talk about is Ms. Simmelweis. So many of you know him uh, as one of the maverick uh, uh, physicians who was born in Hungary, uh, raised and studied and practiced in the city of Vienna in Austria, and then passed away uh, in quite uh, unfortunate circumstances that are there. So one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that he was one of the first physicians who brought into the fact that, you know, hand washing is important and his landmark document and his study that he did in, the, in his hospital 
became the foundation for hand hygiene and uh, hand washing across medical practice that is there today. And definitely he's truly one of what you would call as the pioneers of infection control in healthcare. Unfortunately, he was not recognized during his lifetime and uh, he uh, died unfortunately without knowing what is the impact of his thinking. But many years after his death, his publication that came out in 1863, uh, the document that talked about the study, which we're going to illustrate further, uh, became a landmark uh, documentation for us. So coming to the next slide over here, you will see this was the study that uh, Ignace Semmelweis did at his Vienna General Hospital. Now, what was the best part of this hospital was it ran two clinics, especially for pregnant women who were about to deliver kids, who were about to deliver children that was there. So the first clinic, which was done on alternate days of Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, was run by medical students. And the second, which was run on Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and Saturday, was run by midwives. Now, one of the major things that he saw was that, you know, most women preferred to come to the second clinic and then deliver uh, during the midwives. And he was confused why were women not willing to come and deliver into the hospital when medical students were to do. So one of the interesting things that came out during his study was he started observing what are the preparal sepsis rates that was there during these two clinics. One of the things that he studied over the years, he saw that, you know, the preparal sepsis rate was much higher in the first clinic, which was marked by the pink line over here uh, in the medical student system versus what was there in the midwife system. Now, what was interesting that he observed the practice of both of these teams and observed that they pretty much did the same things, except with one change was that uh, medical students used to go to the postmortem unit and do the autopsy over there and then come directly and then do delivery of uh, uh, you know, the children without washing their hands. So what he said was that during this autopsy, there was something that was being attached to the medical students' hands, which was causing the preparing sepsis. Now, we didn't have the germ theory back then, but he knew that he said that there was something in their hands that was causing this system. So unfortunately, during his lifetime, uh, as soon as Mr. Semmelweis, uh, Dr. Semmelweis never received uh, the recognition that he deserved. You know, he published the document in 1863 just before he passed away. But it took many years after that to, for people to realize that, you know, it was uh, the not washing hands that was the reason for this reason. Now, a lot of people mocked him during his time. I know uh, most pioneers are in the way that, you know, they are not recognized during their lifetime, but much later. So he was also mocked for his uh, practice and things like that. Uh, uh, you are telling something wrong. But later it was found out that what he said was true. So the not washing hands, infections which you transmit from patients who used to be for the people who used to do autopsy versus and when he used to come and deliver the same people in the by the medical students. So going on to from the English Semmelweis to what we would like to currently look at is why is May 5th? Now May 5th is celebrated as uh, WHO World Hand Hygiene Day for all healthcare workers. Now this year's theme, if you see over here, it says about clean care is in your hands. And this is dedicated to the nurses and midwives. Now why we are saying this is 2020 is declared as the international year for nurses and midwives uh, because it marks the 200th century of uh, the birth of Florence Nightingale. So the remembrance of Florence Nightingale this year has been declared as the international year of the nurse and midwife. So keeping those them in mind, uh, the, this year's theme every year, WHO has a new theme that comes up. Some talk about antibiotics, some talk about uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, puperal sepsis, other sepsis. Uh, the basic idea was clean hands save lives. Uh, so that's why what it says, we it over here that you know, clean care is in your hands. Now, this theme was prepared before the coronavirus outbreak, but uh, let's understand that this uh, theme that is there, that clean care is in your hands, is pretty much applicable not just for the coronavirus outbreak, but uh, in day-to-day -day situations, both at your home and at your hospital, where you see patients everywhere. So keeping this in mind, so, so we we'll do a number of activities during, uh, usually this day is a very busy day in most other years that will be, will be there. And we'll be, have a lot of programs, a lot of poster presentations, a lot of skits and dramas based on these. But uh, unfortunately, this year, because we're not able to do this, we're doing this through the webinar. So we would encourage all of you to participate uh, ask your questions and uh, clear your doubts as much as possible. Okay. So what is hand hygiene? Now the next question is, cleaning of one hand to prevent the spread of infection is called as hand hygiene. It's as simple as that. Anything that you do to prevent any spread of infection, whether at home or at hospital, just means that is what is mean by hand hygiene. 
the next slide why is this hand hygiene so important because the idea is that if you see thousands of people die every day in the hospitals in our clinics because of hospital acquired infection now or what we call as healthcare associated infection this could be because of improper care or uh, any other reasons for which virus uh, bacteria or virus is spreading and causing this and one of the main things is that our hands uh, these hand digits and these beautiful hand that care for our patients are also unfortunately the sources through which uh, it spreads infection so uh, through the presentation because we touch our faces we touch our nose and our mouths or we touch surfaces we touch our phones which we use a lot to address or the computers that we work on uh, the reports that we write the tests that we sit on all of these surfaces contain bacteria and viruses sitting all over the time because remember whenever you wash and clean any area after some time bacteria and viruses regrow and we follow that we will also see why coronavirus Uh, these surfaces became a very important source of transmission of infection now one of the important things that you note is that we also know that these infections are spread across the world uh, across the panel that is there but hand hygiene has been shown time and time again as one of the best methods of preventing infections in hospitals and even at, at your home and uh, most studies estimate in hospitals that 50% of your infection rate can be brought down by simply protecting by simply doing your hand hygiene and same same works even for coronavirus outbreak pandemic that there so as we said the hand hygiene is required for two reasons is one is that uh, you're protecting your patients so that you're not transmitting infection from your hand to them second thing for protecting yourself is because you're not gathering any patients in, in terms that are there on your hand that you're touching yourself or you're touching any part of your body or ingesting it in your mouth or anywhere else. So because of all these reasons to protect uh, the patient and protect yourself and hygiene becomes a important reason and this is the reason why for important reason why we need to be doing hand hygiene or hand washing that is there now types of hand hygiene i would like to break this into three types and we will illustrate two more types which are more important to us the first one is what is commonly called as hand wash what is usually done with soap and water now this could be with liquid soap or water this could be done for a total last about 45 to 60 seconds this is commonly used everywhere both at home and hospital now the second one is in a hand rub or a alcohol based sanitizer which we use usually typically do for about 20 to 30 seconds this is typically done when your hands are clean visibly not soiled so this can be done in many uh, areas both in hospital and hygiene and uh, hospitals and homes also the so last one is what we call surgical hand wash or surgical scrub which is an antiseptic solution now this is very specific for operation theaters and people who are entering in for sterile procedures so we are not going to concentrate too much on this right now but we are going to talk more on hand wash and hand rub in the subsequent slides that are there right now why uh, this hand wash is very important is this forms the core basis of any infection prevention program or infection control program so hand hygiene is the cornerstone on which all of these develop so hand washing is whenever your hands are visibly soiled you see anything that you touch or picked up something from the floor Gone to the washroom, um, you've uh, used your hands for cooking or anything like that, or you've just touched a patient, or you've touched a urine bag, touched a, uh, a syringe that's there. Now your hands are visibly soiled. So whenever your hands are visibly soiled or they are visibly dirty, there is a dirt or the hands are visibly wet because of some liquid, uh, either it could be water or any other liquid that's there, that are blood or body fluid that's touched your hand, then. you or you have got exposed to a spore forming pathogen like crossing disease you need to wash your hands now how do you wash your hands you use soap and water now what kind of water we'll talk about this a little later the next subsequent steps that are there and how to do this now second situation is when your hands are visibly clean that means you've just gone from patient to patient where to examine patients wearing gloves then you discard your gloves after each patient so what do you do in between patients or when you're doing a simple procedure where you're doing for blood draw or something like that it doesn't need the gloves but needs the clean hands for so those cases we need to be prefer what we do is in the hand rubbing or using an alcohol based sanitizer or alcohol based hand rub so we use an alcohol based gel or a liquid or a foam any of these which are available commercially now what is important is that whenever you use an alcohol based hand rub the alcohol content should be more than 60% now what kind of alcohol it could be both ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol and either of this could be used for uh, doing this uh, sort of hand rub 
please remember alcohol based hand up should not be used when your hands are physically dirty or soiled or wet okay or if you're dwelling with any sport forming pathogen those cases these are not recommended and also not recommended whenever you're dealing with patients with diarrhea especially you are infected children who are infected with rota virus those times better is to wash your hands with soap and water always okay. as we said we talked about two forms of hand washing that is hand washing and hand rubbing these are what forms of hand hygiene that we talked about now question is when should you do hand hygiene now this is very nicely depicted uh, using uh, the five movements of hand hygiene that is there which is given by the who it says before touching the patient before uh, any clean or aseptic procedure after touching the patient after exposure to any body fluid like blood or urine or any of the other things and most importantly the fifth and foremost is whenever you touch any patient surrounding you have to remember over here is that uh, the uh, the patient bed or the patient's area where the patient is located uh, is uh, any 3 feet within that distance is anything that where easily you can get contaminated especially when you're dealing with a patient with coronavirus when the patient sneezes or he coughs if he's not wearing a mask or not using a tissue or not closing his hands uh, in the sink that uh, infection spreads through a droplet method and which can spread up to 3 to 4 by 3 to 4 feet around the patient so whenever you are entering any patient with this number that when you're within within the 3 feet zone of the patient this is the danger zone in which you can be easily exposed so whenever you touch any surfaces please make sure you wash your hands after that right i hope and this is understood very clearly right okay now going ahead uh, to the next uh, this thing is how do you perform hand hygiene there are three things that we require over here is one is you need to have a proper technique second is there has to be a good active ingredient either it could be soap and water or an alcohol based hand thing and the third is that you need to have a proper time duration so time duration and technique and uh, these are the ones that are required as the three key ingredients when it comes to hand hygiene when it's going to work okay now what are a few things that you need to have uh, accessible in your facility that is there now if you see on your pictures on your left to right there are there Uh, you need to have a soap and water that means a sink with water facility clean water facility now this could be hot water or cold water either way it should be okay now could this tap be an elbow operated tap or should it be a sensor based tap or should it be a normal hand operated tap now it depends on what sort of facility you have it doesn't mention anything obviously anything which is sensor based foot operated or elbow operated is better because it presents more aseptic technique in which you want to do the hand hygiene so it avoids pretty much avoid any contact with your hands after you wash it okay now this you will keep in mind why when you do on when we talk about hand washing why this becomes a little important the next one is uh, having a hand rub bottle kept at the patient's foot end of the bed now you would have seen even in the previous picture in the who picture is that uh, we have seen that uh, uh, the hand rub bottle is kept at the foot end because as you approach the patient from the foot end of this thing which is typically you can actually you are typically on the right side of the patient when you are examining the patient we want you to do a hand rub before you enter the patient zone so what basically what is the patient zone as we said earlier it's about 3 feet of area around the patient whenever you are entering a patient going to do any procedure on the patient you need to have a hand rub bottle on the the third one is what we call as hand rub kept in common areas so that means in the passage areas when you are entering into the wards and other areas before you touch the handle or after you touch the handle make sure there is a hand rub bottle kept outside so that uh, the where, where you, you are not touching any unwanted surface areas because the surface high touch of area areas such as uh, high touch of areas such as uh, uh, you know the handles the telephones the computers the mobile phones and all of these area taps faucets these are areas which are typically touched frequently by both patients patient presenters and by doctors and healthcare workers so you need to make sure that these areas whenever you are exposed to such areas make sure that you do a hand hygiene after that so that's why having hand rubs in common areas also just becomes important not just only near the bedside area that is that okay now now we are going to talk about two things over here we are talking about hand rub and we are talking about hand wash now you would see that the timing over here differs but essentially if you look at this slide uh, if you look at steps 2 3 4 5 and 6 and 7 uh, these are the six steps or the six steps for the technique for hand hygiene uh, which are given by who which are also given by the cdc and which are recommended across the world 
Uh, a lot of people say there are seven steps, there are eight steps, but technically if you ask, there are six basic steps in which we need to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to see a video after this. If you're not able to hear the audio, I'm going to give you a little bit of audio playback on this that is there. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the poster which is given by WHO. So I would recommend that uh, all of you put up these, print out these posters. It's given by the WHO World Health Organization. You can put it up in all the areas wherever you're having hand rub stands or hand rub bottles, uh, places so that people are reminded on what are these six steps. And I would also uh, encourage that uh, whenever you're dealing with COVID-19 patients, whenever there are attenders, please make sure that attenders are taught about this hand hygiene technique so that they are uh, safe themselves and they take care of their patients and their uh, patients well better. Okay. Now the next slide, uh, uh, we will be playing this video that is there. So this is from the WHO. This is taken from the uh, uh, YouTube. If you're not able to hear the audio, don't worry. I'm just giving you an audio uh, background of what's happening around. So as he says, uh, hand, hand rub that we're talking about, this is only when your hands are not visibly soiled that is there. So one of the easiest ways to remember is how do you do these six steps and how do you count for 20 seconds of time is you do each step five times. You count the number of five times. So and that's when you do this. So if you see here, the lady over here is taking a hand rub into a hand. She's putting about uh, three to four ml, which is sufficient for her. The first step is palm to palm. Then comes the palm over dorsum. Then vice versa, the left hand over the right hand dorsum should be done. Then there's an interlacing that would be done over here. Once the interlacing is done, then the interlocking of the knuckles are done. So the knuckles are clean for both the directions of both the hands. Once the knuckles are clean, then we are going to do the thumb rotation that is there. Now this is a very important step. We are not to remember, not to forget over here that you clasp the entire thumb when you're doing the rotation that's there. Last but not the least is the finger rotation with the fingertips to make sure that the fingernails and any of these things are cleaned under them. So make sure that by the end of 20 to 30 seconds, your hand should be clean and dry. And that's when you can say that you've completed it. So without the hands being dry, please do not go and touch any of the other surfaces that are there, right? Okay. Now that you've seen hand uh, rub, this is, those are the, uh, the six basic steps, six steps. Now we'll look at hand washing. Now the reason you, you would see 40 to 60 seconds is that this is the total time required from the beginning of the procedure to the end of the procedure. This seems a little longer procedure because there are a few more additional steps, but the six basic steps, again, if you see uh, the same numbers, steps numbers two, three, four, five, six, and seven, the same basic six steps are the same. And this accounts for about 20 to 30 seconds as usual, as what you're doing with hand rub. Now, alcohol-based hand rubs definitely act as a faster method versus hand washing, but each one has their own uh, merits and demerits. We will look at that a little later, okay? So now again over here, you would see that the same six steps are used over here. Now, one of the things that you would also see that it talks about surgical hand antiseptics. We are not going to get into that right now. We're going to primarily concentrate on hand washing and hand rub. So let's look at the next video which talks about uh, hand washing and what are the steps are there. You can observe carefully over here, what are the different steps that would be there. So now the question is, how do you do a hand wash with soap and water? Is there any difference in the steps? Try to observe and see if there are any differences. Now this is typically an example that she's showing in a faucet and that we use in our toilet over here or in our nurse station that we'll be doing this. So the first thing is you wet your hands, take soap, and then you would see that uh, once the amount of soap is made again, the same step, steps number two to seven, repeat again, palm to palm, palm or dorsum, and then vice versa. And you would see that she would be then doing into the interlacing over here. Now, one good way to remember how many seconds we spend is that, as I said, you count each step five times, or else the other best thing is to remember is make sure that you sing happy birthday song twice, that would last you about 20 seconds, or you can sing even if you're okay to sing ABCD, uh, but just make sure that you know, singing this, you're singing this in your mind, not allowed, because if you somebody hears you singing happy birthday song, people may ask you a few more questions. So after that, the seven steps, uh, step number seven is that you need to wash off your hands, make sure that the entire soap is removed from your hands. Now you would see that she would be using a disposable towel over here, paper towel, this is what should be used uh, we preferably we don't prefer to use a hand rub, uh, I'm sorry, a towel over here, after which the towel is used to wash the tap over here. If you have a foot operator or a sensor-based missing, this is a lot more useful over here. 
So as you saw, the same seven steps do the between uh, the two uh, techniques do not really change too much. It's the same seven steps that is uh, the six steps that are existing steps number two to seven, which work as the same. So the six steps that are there by WHO and CDC are approved across the world and practiced by practitioners across the globe, across the world everywhere. Like that, right? Okay. Now, question is now that you're doing hand hygiene, now to make sure that how do you make sure that somebody is doing this correctly becomes important. Now, there are different practices and various methods to improve motivation of people doing this because one we have to understand is that uh, we are uh, humans are a creature of habits unless uh, hand hygiene or these steps become part of our habitual situation we don't tend to repeat it so that's the reason why we need to make sure that these steps are repeated over and over again in our mind so that they become a part of our habit and it doesn't change it becomes a part of our system that is there now a good way to teach people is how do you understand this technique? How do you make sure that people understand this six step technique that we just now saw? Either way, you're doing hand rub or hand rub or washing is what we do is we do a, a gel based system. What we do is we ask people to come into the classroom, we put in a gel onto their hands, which is about the same size of this thing. Once you rub this gel on your hands and we ask them to repeat the steps as per what they know, then we ask them to put it under a UV light. So under the UV light, what happens is gel is a fluorescent gel, which lights up the areas which you have rubbed well, and it doesn't light up the areas which are not lighted well. So those remain dark over here. So that means it tells you that when you're doing hand hygiene back and front, which are the areas. You saw the picture earlier also. Typically, the areas which are not covered are, you know, the dorsum of the hand, the base of the thumb, sometimes the back of the hand, the dorsum of the hand is not covered. All of these areas are the ones which are not covered. So these are the typical likely areas that we typically miss out. So very important is that uh, time and technique, both are important when it comes to good hand hygiene practice. So this UV tool that is there, this is a good teaching tool that could be there. Uh, number of uh, uh, companies, number of hospitals are also doing this. They come to this every year. So then it's a good test for everyone to understand whether they know this uh, technique well or not. And this can be implemented for everyone right from a uh, entry level nurse to the senior most uh, consultant who is there. Uh, it's a great learning tool for all of us. Okay. Now, how do you do uh, a hand hygiene audit on a regular basis? Now, this is one big challenge for all our infection control nurses uh, across. I'm sure they all understand the pain of doing this activity because this is one activity which a lot of people don't really understand. A lot of people don't understand what it is about, why this is being done. Now, very important is that you see everybody uses the, the, the WHO format, which is called as the WHO Hand Hygiene Observation Tool, or what we call as the Hand Hygiene Tool. Now, this is divided into different columns over here. You see there is some basic entry on the details that you enter, what are the facilities, what are the time duration that you do, what department, what country you're from. And then you also tell um, there are four columns over here, each column representing one healthcare worker. Now, typically what we do is we tell people to go to a, a, a unit to observe where they would spend about uh, 20 to 30 minutes observing at best four people at a time because that's that's maximum you can observe in that time period that is there. But if you want to observe more, you can always take extra sheets, have them collated. So on the vertical side, you would see you are numbers one to eight. These are the opportunities that are there. And then uh, on the right hand side, you would see what are the actions that they have done. So the indications that the, what we talked about WHO are the opportunities. That is the five opportunities, all of you remember, before touching the patient, before any aseptic procedure, uh, after uh, any blood or body fluid exposure, after touching the patient, and after touching the patient. So the easiest way to remember is two befores and three afters that are there. That's how you remember. So now the action that you take is either it could be hand rub or it could be hand wash, it doesn't matter. The second thing, whether you use gloves and or a third thing is whether you miss this action. So when you calculate on the uh, audit side, you, what you would observe is, first of all, take the number of opportunities that you're expecting and what are the opportunities that are there. Now, if for example, if you are going there for doing a simple blood draw, how many opportunities do you expect? That means before touching the patient, there's an opportunity. After touching the patient, there's an opportunity. So that means there are two opportunities for that nurse. So you write a nurse out there, top of that column, you take two opportunities that she's going to do a blood draw before touching and after touching. Now you observe either of these, both of these times, 
whether the action has been done, whether it was a hand drop or a hand wash. If it was a hand drop or a hand wash, you simply tick HR or HW, one of those. If it is missed, you say the person has missed. So what you would do is now what you would do is you would calculate all the total number of uh, actions that are being done in the entire sheet. Now there are about 32 opportunities that are there. You can see this eight into four that you see that are there in each sheet. So you, total number of uh, opportunities that were there out of that, maybe you saw about 20 opportunities for four people that you saw. Total opportunities were 20, while the total number of actions they did was about uh, 14 or something. So 14 divided by 20 is uh, giving you about a percentage of about 70%, which is there. Now, this is uh, an overall compliance of hand hygiene and what is how the hand hygiene audit is done. So this is very brief about how do you do the hand hygiene audit uh, in the hospital or uh, at any facility that is there. So different variations of this uh, that would be there and we would see how we do this, okay? So this is a very good tool. Uh, this is also accepted by the NABH and this even by the JCI. When they come, auditors come, they expect that you, you've done a hand hygiene audit tool and you've upgraded your tool. Now, the second audit tool that would be there is to check how well the technique is being done. So that means when you want to drill down to the point where how well is the people being doing, doing the, the same as that, when you observe the hand hygiene being done, how well are they doing this, uh, this thing is check the technique, whether the six steps are being done properly or not. So this is a, a competency checklist. So if you want people to do this and repeat in front of you and you want to score them on individually how well competent they are, then this is a checklist that you would be using over here. Okay. So now once the hand hygiene is done and the audit is done, you make sure the collated data is sent across to your infection control chairperson or infection control officer. And these results are then shared with all the important people that are there uh, in the hospital. Now, question is, now uh, after knowing all of this about hand hygiene, now uh, we would like to know what is the role of hand hygiene in the prevention and spread of this new coronavirus or this COVID-19 virus that we are currently facing today, uh, which is the major pandemic. Now the question is, we will divide it into two parts is, what do you do uh, at home when you're outside the hospital and then what would you do in the hospital and what uh, what are the precautions that you need to take and what are the role of hand hygiene in both of these cases. Now, uh, uh, just to give you a little background, what are the symptoms of this novel coronavirus disease that we see? Uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, any symptoms within the two to 14 days of exposure. Now, this is a slightly older one. It talks about exposure when you have traveled to China, but uh, basically if you've had any history of travel, uh, basically, and you've had these symptoms, uh, now there are a few more other symptoms, but these are the three classical symptoms that you will see anyone who's having fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and has had history of exposure of people who are traveling outside the country or traveling within the state or other places they've traveled or they've met with in the region. So again, it becomes very important that, you know, we uh, target these people and, you know, send them for screening that is there. And then uh, once the screening is done, the, then the doctor decides whether uh, he or she requires what kind of tests according to that. So there's a link over here you will see there, uh, you want to learn a little more about this uh, YouTube video is also there. Now, what are the things that you need to remember at home? What do you need to tell uh, your loved ones at home? What are the things that you need to tell your friends and relatives that are there? Is that, uh, first thing is that very important, wash your hands thoroughly clean, okay? With soap and water or with an alcohol-based hand or whichever is available to them. Make sure that you spend those 20 to 30 seconds, valuable seconds when you're doing this. So wash your hands as much as possible. That means before you cook your food, before you eat your food, before you, uh, after you go to the toilet, uh, after you touch any surfaces, after you go out of the house and you come back inside, make sure you wash your hands, make sure you wash your feet and other things when you go to the inside. Make sure that whenever you're going out, maintaining a distance between yourself, I'm sure you all understood the next time you go to the shop to buy groceries or something, make sure that you're maintaining distance between you and other places. Avoid going to crowded places. Now we know that, you know, the COVID uh, lockdown has been slowly been lifted off. That doesn't mean that you start rushing back to the thing. Try and avoid crowded places that is there. So avoid touching your face, nose, and eyes and mouth. And because whatever you've touched on different surfaces, the moment you touch your face, allowing that to be ingested into your face. Whether you touch your face or you're coughing, you your hands around. So whenever you're coughing or you're sneezing, make sure you do it into your elbow and you sneeze it into your elbow, yeah. Or else use uh, disposable tissue paper. And after you do that, make sure that you dispose it and put it in a dustbin like that. Next thing is make sure that you have good respiratory hygiene that we talked about at home. 
Now, whenever you have any symptoms of cough, headache, fever, or you feel there's been a history of travel, make sure you stay at home before you go to the hospital. Make sure you call up the hospital, see whether they are treating these kind of cases because. Not all hospitals are admitting patients which have COVID-19 infection. Please call up the hospital before you go. Second thing, last but not the least, please do not trust whatever you see on WhatsApp saying that there's a magical drink for coronavirus. This has come. That Baba Ji has given this thing. This has been given this thing. Don't do not trust on all the WhatsApp forwards that you get. Please go to trusted websites like the WHO or your local or national health authorities. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India has been doing a fantastic job of giving you updates every day. So there is that. Even if you are uh, from different state, each different state has developed called uh, has formed a tele helpline where you can call them up and ask whether what are the problems that they are having. You can discuss your symptoms and they will guide you to the nearest hospital that is there. Right. So all of all this, washing your hands, keeping yourself clean, and having hygienic practices becomes important. Now, what about for people in the healthcare workers situation? Over here also, as we said. Uh, ensuring that the moment you get patients you're doing a proper triage early recognition and you're trying to source track the source where they uh, they got the source from and whenever you're doing in this thing you're wearing proper ppe you're following standard precautions at all times remember you treat every patient as potentially infectious so that's the reason why you wear proper ppe and you do a proper hand hygiene so we'll talk about the proper ppes a little later so additional to the standard precautions you follow additional uh, transmission based precautions which is contact droplet and airborne precautions and the other thing is that you need to have good administrative controls that means administrative teams you need to make sure that there are sufficient ppe sufficient uh, sanitizers all of these tests are available test kits are available in the hospital so that they can do these tests that are there last but not the least uh, using in engineering and environment controls in fact uh, in the in the previous uh, webinar yesterday we saw that how it's easy to convert some of these wards into negative pressure rooms and how to make sure they become isolated rooms they're not very difficult but they can be done by making simple changes that are there so environment engineering controls become important so please make sure that you discuss with your engineering team or your biomedical engineering team at hospitals and make sure that wards which are dedicated for coronavirus cases with proper engineering control uh, kept over there for preventing the spread of these infections so as we said uh, not just we need to talk about standard precautions that are there we need to talk about additional precautions whenever you are entering a patient in the room make sure that you are wearing proper gloves cap mask gown uh, ppe a face shield that is required uh, surgical mask or a n95 respirator as and when required uh, based on what kind of procedures you are doing over here okay usually what we suggest is the patient wear a surgical mask uh, suspected uh, the healthcare workers the patient attendants also wear a surgical mask now as a norm uh, the healthcare workers who are sitting in opd in other places should be wearing at least a surgical mask and those who are in the icu in other places those who are doing aerosol generating procedures they should be having an n95 respirator that is there that is airborne precautions that need to be maintained that is there so the question is how do you identify these respirators and how do you identify these face masks and this thing so i have just taken a common example over here on your left hand side and right hand side both of them are what we call as n95 respirator so please remember when we say n95 this is the the us system of certifying these masks or respirators that are there while if you see the word f ffp2 or a p2 then these are the european method of the thing so if you see anything ffp2 and 3 onwards the equivalent to n95 and above okay so ffp1 is less ffp2 is equivalent to n95 and above so n95 or ffp2 anyone who has uh, been genuinely tested their material whether they are manufacturers in india or other, abroad if you have got yourself tested uh, uh, with the niosh this thing you can actually put the word niosh and n95 on your mask it allows you to print that second thing there are standards even in india which have been given by the ministry of health and family welfare which follow the same standard so please make sure that the certificates are provided by the manufacturers saying that this is a genuine n95 or an ffp2 mask that is there now the second question is how do you identify surgical mask correctly now a surgical mask is a typically what we call as a three layer mask which has three layers of filtration one of the things that you got to remember is that it should have a bacterial filtration more than 95% and a particulate filtration more than 99% typically this is printed on the box 
plus it should have additional certification on splash proofing and also on the, the partial diffusion pressure so it forms what is called as the indian standards of 16289 is the standard for which surgical masks are tested according to them so you should have labs that certify them saying that these are tested for uh, these uh, procedures and these are certified as surgical masks so please check for these certificates when you are uh, buy a surgical mask that is there. so that is is 16289.2014 uh, that's the uh, you know the indian standard for surgical mask which you need to be testing these are there also given by the ministry of health and family welfare also so if you go to the website uh, the rational use of pp you can see these uh, specifications are also mentioned over there okay as i said check for certificates so the last but not the least uh, whenever you are entering an existing room you should be a, a proper technique in which you wear the uh, the pp that is what is called as donning and also a proper technique in the the steps in which you need to remove this thing which is called as doffing okay now very important is that uh, this is a, a more of a visual procedure it's going to be difficult for you to just look at the cbc poster and understand this so the wonderful thing is that aims new delhi uh, has published a wonderful video on youtube if you go to youtube uh, it's a free video you say aims and ppe if you search for that uh, you would get uh, this video on youtube on youtube if you search for aims and pp you should be able to get this video it's a wonderful video discussing how healthcare workers should be donning on pp and doffing or removing the pp as you exit the rooms and very important when you have to understand is why hand hygiene becomes so important when you're removing the pp why at each step you need to do a hand hygiene uh, and then step going forward so this is the basically uh, the idea of donning and doffing so with that what we would like to do is uh, we would like to summarize what we have learned for today as you said uh, hand hygiene is the most important step in the prevention of infection in healthcare scenario that is there please make sure that uh, you practice hand rub or hand wash depending on what is the condition of your hand if your hands are visibly soiled you do hand wash if your hands are visibly clean you do hand rub so report any uh, suspected symptoms of patients who have a good careful history taking so triaging and history taking is very important use proper ppe that is required uh, when you want to handle any of these patients and always make sure that when you are uh, maintaining a proper social distance as you see the picture over here if you shake hands which is the typical method at which hands when you shake they transmit infections so it's always uh, good that uh, you follow the indian method please say namaste and stay social distance from each other and uh, continue forward so with that i would like to say thank you uh this is my name and number and the email address uh, on to anyone who wants to ask any question directly to us but uh, uh, i will allow jeet to open it up to uh, you to give any questions and the answers uh, any questions and answers that are there please yeah, uh, uh, thank you teacher yeah shashank thank you very much for your wonderful presentation uh there are a lot many questions here which have come up but we will just take uh, a selected few uh, okay. one question is what are the possibilities of transfer of infection from the knob of the hand rub bottle okay so now uh, now over here if you see this is a typical hand rub bottle that is there now if you see here now what they are asking is whether this knob and i press and i uh, press from this and do i take uh, this thing so there are two ways to take care of this one is that we have uh, hospitals which have elbow based taps which usually this goes into a stand and there's a there's a lever that comes out of this which presses that now if you don't have that situation remember whenever you press this you're putting an antiseptic a disinfectant liquid antiseptic liquid into your hands so whatever that you have germs that you've collected from the knob uh, of the this thing when it comes on the hand when you're using a, a, the alcohol antiseptic it kills that so you don't have to worry about that uh, chances of transmission from the knob of the bottle is very unlikely uh, so don't worry about that so that will take care of the hand rub steps will take care of that yes do you have any other questions uh yeah shashank uh, there's another question uh, raised here 
What are your views about alcohol-free hand sanitizers with yeah. inorganic silver nanoparticles as they are known antibacterial and antiviral? Okay. Now, unfortunately, uh, now when it comes to this, this is a very good question. Uh, a lot of people ask us, do we recommend anything other than alcohol-based sanitizers uh, that is there? Unfortunately, if you look at our current guidelines, that's the WHO and the CDC, which is commonly accepted across the world. And also, if you look at what the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India discusses, is that they follow these two things. And these two guidelines, unfortunately, have not reviewed any of these silver-based nanoparticle uh, hand sanitizers. Uh, unfortunately, there is uh, less data. They may have some, some of their own data that is there. But unfortunately, since the guidelines do not recommend any of these, so it will be difficult for us in this platform to recommend any of these. So I'll go by what the CDC and the WHO says and what the ministry says, is that go with an alcohol-based sanitizer. Alcohol concentration should be more than 60%. It could be either ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, uh, another one, uh, because as you all know, uh, that people are going for N95 masks. Even people, you street, see people on the streets using N95 masks. And so yeah. definitely there is scarcity of resources. Yeah. One question which has been raised is, uh, is mouth mask N95 recommended for disinfection now? It is because of scarcity of resources. So what I would say over here is that N95 mask is primarily should be restricted only for people who are using uh, this for any aerosol generating procedure. So when I say aerosol generating procedure, that means if I'm doing an intubation, whereas I'm going in, the patient may cough or he may sneeze, so that may lead to an aerosol that's being formed. Or if I'm doing a bronchoscopy or an endoscopy, that could lead to a aerosol being generated. So N95 should be primarily restricted for people who are doing aerosol generating procedure. And this is what is even mentioned by the WHO and the CDC also. Although there are some recommendations from some other uh, agencies which say that, you know, uh, N95 should be used for all healthcare workers. Uh, I do not uh, primarily agree with this. Uh, what we would prefer is that people use the surgical mask, a good certified surgical mask. Unfortunately, because there are not certified masks available, a lot of people prefer to go for N95 mask. But again, when it comes to N95 mask, please make sure there are proper certifications before you buy and use these masks. Uh, another very important question, uh, which has been raised, because uh, you see uh, many suppliers are supplying now uh, the complete PPE suits, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, now, uh, there are instances where they have failed the quality check. Yes. Now, how to ensure that a proper PPE has been supplied to the hospitals? So, uh, the, the good question. Uh, so, this has been given by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in a document saying that uh, the PPEs have to follow a standard called as ISO 16603, Level 3 certification. So, that means if they pass the level three certification, which is basically a blood penetration test, basically they allow blood to be put onto the uh, PPA and allow put it put, put a pressure. If it penetrates through this thing, that means it fails. If it passes, then it definitely is uh, certified. So, the uh, sorry for that. Uh, this would be uh, given by a certificate, preferably from the Citra, which is a South Indian Textile Research Institute, or from DRT from Gwalior, or from a third party lab. The, any good manufacturer should be able to produce these certificates to you by a third party NABL accredited lab or any of these other labs that I've mentioned. Uh, another question which is self explanatory in fact, uh, can we reuse PPE? Okay, uh, if yes. so before we answer that question now, the question I just wanted to answer, I'm, I'm just seeing over here is that uh, should we use a hand dryer over uh, hand towels? Now the question is very simple. Uh, if you're using either of those, those are fine. Uh, hand dryers versus hand towels are either okay. When you say hand towels, we preferably prefer to use paper-based towels, which are disposable, not the cloth-based towels. Now coming to reuse of PPE, now here there is not much of uh, clarity that is there. But what I can say is that there is a, a company which makes, uh, a particular company that makes uh, these masks, 3M, uh, which is the company which makes M95 masks. They are the only company that has come forward and said that our 
N95 respirators can be reused uh, and re-sterilized in an autoclave. In an autoclave, when I say autoclave, not a particular autoclave, but in a particular uh, hydrogen peroxide-based sterilizer, which is called as uh, the Steris Vipro. That's what it certifies. I'm saying that you know this is not very commonly found in India, so I would rather not follow this system. So I would rather follow what the AIMS and the CDC recommend. Is where each mask can be used up to five times, so five days that is there. So at the end of the, the this thing is that the hospital gives about 24 masks to you. Use it up to 20 days after which you discard it. So each day you keep it in a brown paper bag and then allow it to sun dry in the sun and then reuse it at the uh, at the next after four or five days. So this reuse technique. So if you want to see this, you go to YouTube. Uh, uh, and search for AIMS and PPE and reuse, you will see this video link also, where the doctor from AIMS New Delhi clearly shows how to reuse the uh, mask that is there. So I would say that's a better technique rather than waiting for this because this sterilization of uh, PPE is not a very clear science yet. I wouldn't recommend following. Uh, I know there are a lot of rumors saying that we can use uh, UV light, uh, why not use formalin tablet, a lot of these uh, I would straight away say that do not stick to any of these, stay away, stick, stick away from all of them. Uh, just follow what the AIMS, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences has given. That's, I think, uh, a more feasible technique for India currently that I would say. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, this is uh, a very tricky question and very confusing answer is, again, self-explanatory. In areas where there is no running water or soap. Okay. Is as allowed for a hand wash. Some have made bins of soap water and plain water. How many times can one wash in such? Okay, so these are in areas where you don't have running soap water. What you do? So then the best thing is to have a bin with uh, plain water and uh, liquid soap or anything that is kept on the side. I would prefer saying that do not mix this. Make don't make a soap water liquid and use this combinedly. So use the soap and uh, bucket separately. So as the person washes their hands with soap, make sure that someone else pours with the bucket and uh, cleans their hands with that water. So preferably running water is always preferred. Still water is not preferred. So wherever it is not possible, a bucket of water with the mug separate, a liquid soap or a bar soap separate. Do not mix these. So after they wash their hands, they can wash their hands with uh, uh, mug and water. Yeah. Uh, so, Sashank, uh, I think we should wind up because time is also uh, running out and uh, very well presented the entire discussion, the content and the way you have presented that is fabulous. Uh, on behalf of uh, the presenters uh, and the speakers here, we would like to thank Kaho and Ayushman Bharat for giving us this opportunity to be here to present this uh, seminar, a very important uh, topic in healthcare and with the recent uh, situation which has come because of the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Now it is very, very important that we should be following hand wash and hygiene in all the hospitals and also in our day-to-day -day activities, our lives. Thank you so much, Sashank. Thank you, uh, Kaho.